Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. You know, we're doing a series uh, called Love Is, and we have been uh, working our way through Paul's discussion of love found in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. We are, I think, on the sixth attribute that we're covering, and we're, we've, we've kind of combined a couple, so, uh, so we're on six this week. And uh, so far, we've discovered that love is patient and kind. We've discovered that love is not jealous or boastful or arrogant or rude. And last week, we talked about love being selfless and flexible. So this week, we are going to be uh, talking about something else. So you can see up on the screen what we have talked about already. Let's pray about it. Heavenly Father, uh, we look at that list of things that's on the screen, and uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who looks at that and feels a little bit inadequate. I look at it and think, wow, that's, that's pretty lofty. That's pretty aspirational. We thank you, Lord, that you, that you are that way to us and that you have grace for us as we allow you to transform us to be more and more like you. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. So today we're going to talk about this. Love is not irritable. And if I'm going to be honest with you, this irritated me. (laughs) I looked at what Paul said and I thought, I don't like that. I mean... I get that love needs to be patient and kind. I get that we shouldn't be rude, that we need to be selfless. I get those things. It's like, okay, I get that. But Paul, irritable? I mean, is that really something you can help anyway, right? I mean, anybody else looking at you think, man, if love is not irritable, and some of you, some of you, you know, bless your hearts. I'm sure some of you here are like, you're you're just, you're like, I don't understand, Ken. I'm, I'm never irritable. And, and you know what? I want to spend some time with you. I am not that person. I'd like to tell you I was. I'd like to tell you I'm somebody different, but I'm not. I have, I don't, I, if there's a gene for irritability, I know I have it. It may be the red hair. I don't know what it is. But irritability, and so I look at this one, I thought, oh, I've got to preach on that. And while many of you don't know me super well now, there are people who I know will be watching this online who are going to be listening carefully to what I have to say about this and maybe judging me a little bit. So I just want to put out there at the beginning, this is some aspirational stuff, okay? This is stuff that, you know, uh, it bothers me sometimes that we, we want to say that people who are pastors or who, maybe even mental health professionals, that, that, that they don't have the issues that they deal with in their own life, right? Nobody's perfect, just Jesus. All of us are working on something, and if you're not working on something, that might be a big problem too. That might be something to think about. So today, let's just take a moment to be honest. What makes you irritated? I'd love for you to go to menti.com. Uh, you just type that into your smart device, menti.com. If you have the app, you can go to that. And you're going to put in the code 21225295. Now, for those of you at home, this is really your opportunity to join here. You can really let us feel your presence by going to uh, menti.com. And what I want you to do is just type in what makes you irritated. What makes you irritated? So, you know, this is going to become a word cloud. And so, you know, you might want to keep it a little bit more short. But, you know, type in whatever you want. Please avoid names. Is that fair? Can we just say, just because love wouldn't name somebody, right? So if you're thinking about typing my name in, you know, don't hurt my feelings, okay? Um, but, so, but don't type in names, but just what irritates you? And we will even ask you to avoid naming politicians, although all of us could name a couple, right? So we're not going to go ahead and put those in. But what we are going to do is 
things that irritate you. And maybe we can take a look and see how our word cloud is coming. I don't know. Um, let's see here. There we go. So, <laughs> yes, I am seeing some things. Uh, I see. Well, see, look at that. Somebody is like, I know I'm not supposed to write a name, but I wrote sister there. So that's, uh, that, that's generic enough. I allow it. I allow it. All right. So you can see that we're getting some things. You keep going as I'm, as I'm talking. You know, you're more than welcome to keep doing this. And we're going to actually come back to this screen a little bit later and follow up with the things that we're seeing on that screen. Um, but what I'd like to do now is uh, take a look at one of the basic principles that I hope that you're kind of catching on to. When we say that love is, we're talking about relationship. Love equals relationship. What are, are you following what I mean by that? All of the things that we've talked about, love is patient and kind. All these things either build relationships up or they destroy relationships. And so when you look at what Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 7, what we can know is that patience and kindness build relationships up. Selflessness and flexibility creates and grows positive relationships. On the other hand, we can know that that jealousy, boastfulness, arrogance, rudeness, those are all things that eat into and destroy positive relationships. And so when we start talking about irritability, This is why Paul included it on the list, because it's such an important thing for us to think about. Irritability is a signal that a relationship could be in trouble. I'll just put it this way. The problem of irritability is not so much the feeling of irritability. After all, we can't always control how we feel, right? If something, there's like, somebody put food stuck in teeth, I would actually tell you some things that irritate me, but I was doing it during practice and everybody here was threatening to do what I was saying while I'm preaching and I can't take that risk because, uh, I'll just tell you and then you guys can all do it, but chewing ice. Chewing ice, I get a headache. Literally, if somebody's chewing I get a headache and I cannot concentrate, it's not, and so like, Somebody was joking about, well, everybody on the front row will chew ice one south. I said, I'd probably have to quit preaching. I just, I don't think I could handle it. And so now you know how to get me off the platform when you need to, right? You can say, okay, Kenneth, you're done. Here's some ice. We'll be done. But it just, so can I control that feeling any more than you can control for those of you who don't like the sound of fingers on a chalkboard? I don't know that I can really control that, but there are certain things that I can do about that. There's certain things that I can control within my response to that irritation. And so that's what I really want you to think about a little bit because irritation is a signal in the same way that pain is a signal in your body. If you feel pain in your mouth, it's a signal that it may be time to go see a dentist. You might have something that needs to be checked up on. And irritation is the same kind of thing. It's a signal that something might not be right. Let me tell you a story from the Bible. Um, It's the the first time that we see irritation displayed in the Bible that I noticed. And you might notice it before, but this is the first time that I really see it come out. It's in Genesis chapter four. There are two brothers. They are the brothers that are born to Adam or their sons that are born to Adam and Eve. And the Bible tells us that they both bring sacrifices to God in Genesis 4, okay? So Cain brings produce. He's a farmer, so he brings produce as a, as a sacrifice to God. And Abel, who's a shepherd, brings some of the, his flock to, to God. And the Bible then says that God had regard for Abel's sacrifice but not for Cain's. Now, when I read that as a child, I got to tell you, I thought it was a little unfair, right? Because why did God favor Abel's sacrifice over Cain's? And I was brought up believing that it was because Cain brought the wrong sacrifice. We all, growing up, were told that the right sacrifice to give to God was a lamb, right? You give a lamb. And so Cain didn't bring a lamb. And so God didn't have regard for his sacrifice. 
And, um, and as I've studied it as an adult, the text says something a little bit different when you look at it really carefully. Because what we see is that in other places in the Old Testament, we see sacrifices of grain offerings and other kinds of offerings. So there are, so the language in Genesis 4 becomes very important. What I left out as I was telling this to you was that the language in Genesis chapter 4 says that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and the choicest cuts of meat from his flock as a sacrifice to God. But the language for, for Cain is that Cain just brought some stuff from his garden. This is important. He didn't bring his best. And the Bible points this out. If you look at it very carefully, you'll see this. It just says that he brought some stuff from his garden. He didn't bring his best. He didn't bring the first fruits of his garden. He didn't bring the biggest watermelon. He didn't bring the juiciest apple. He just brought some stuff from his garden and said, here, God, this is good enough, right? See how that changes the spin of it a little bit? Because always before I was like, well, that's not really fair that God's like, I mean, this is his, what he does, and this is what, but that's, if you read the Bible very carefully in Genesis chapter four, it never blames Cain for what, for the thing he brought as much as the, it blames him for not bringing his best. And so the Bible says that Cain becomes very deeply disturbed. In fact, if we were to put it into the Ken Wetmore paraphrase, it says that he, um, he, he got pouty and angry. He got irritated. Hey, God, I brought you a sacrifice. What's wrong? Why are you, why are you favoring my brother over here? My little brother. Come on. He got irritated. And God actually has a conversation with him. And he says to, he says to Cain, Cain, if you'd done what was right, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Beware, sin is at your door and it's ready to pounce on you. But you must be the master over it. You hear that? This is going to become very important in our talk about irritability. You must become the master over it. In other words, God says, hey, I get that you're feeling upset, but you need to do a little bit more introspection and ask yourself why it is that I had regard for Abel's and not yours. You need to go ahead and understand that sin is waiting to jump on you and you're walking right towards it with your irritability. Cain doesn't listen. And he allows that irritability to go further and further and it festers to the point where he actually commits the first recorded murder murders his own brother. And that's what I want to say to you about irritability. Unmastered and unchecked, it leads to a lot of other problems in our life. I will use the word sins in our life. Unchecked irritability leads us to bitterness. Unchecked, it leads us to being ungraceful. Unchecked, it leads us to being unkind. Unchecked, it leads us to not be patient. Unchecked, it leads us to being rude. And I suppose in the most extreme cases, unchecked, it can lead to murder and violence. And that's why Paul includes irritability in his discussion. Now, I have to tell you, The interesting thing is that this word that Paul used for love is not irritable, it's a verb, okay? Usually we use this as a descriptive word when we say say irritable, it's it's a descriptor, right? But Paul's using it as a verb. And there's only one other place in the New Testament where this Greek word is used. And I thought it was an interesting one because it doesn't, it's one of those head scratchers for me. It's found the only other place in the New Testament where this word is used for it, that love is not irritable is in this verse, Acts 17, verse 16, where it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Now, I like that the New Living Translation kind of sanitizes this, but they sanitized it because what it would be better translated is while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply irritated 
by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. So that deeply troubled. So I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. Now, Paul said that love is not irritable. And yet the only other place in the Bible where that's, that word is used is here. And I don't really see that as a negative, right? It's not really a negative, is it? Paul was deeply irritated by the idols he saw. So here's something that I would go ahead and point. Remember that I said that love always comes back to relationship. So the question is, when Paul was deeply irritated here, what did he do about his deep irritation? Did he leave the city and stomp off and be like, I'm abandoning you to your false gods. I am deeply irritated and angry with you, and I will leave you to God's judgment. That's not what he does. Acts 17, uh, the rest of the chapter tells us that Paul goes and he starts to have a debate with the people in Athens. And we might go, well, is that really the best way to go about having, you know, trying to bring people to Jesus? Well, Paul felt like it was because he was in a city that valued debate. They like to debate a lot. And so Paul said, I'm going to try that out. I'm going to go ahead. And Paul was a brilliant scholar and Paul did well. Now, I will say he didn't have a whole lot of converts in Athens. Is that because of the mentality of the people there? Is that because of the effectiveness of of his evangelism tactic? Scholars can argue about that. The point, though, is, is that what irritability in this case drove Paul to. It drove him towards trying to create relationship, not away from relationship. And so when we feel irritated, the question is, what are we going to do about that? Are we going to let it separate us from people, or are we going to let it push us towards a deeper relationship? I, I mentioned to you that, that I don't like chewing ice, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and I've, told my, the, the, I've told our staff here at Whole Life Church, um, you know, in, in staff meetings, it's not you, it's me, but please love me and, and don't chew ice during staff meetings because it'll be hard for me to, to concentrate. And I'm grateful that I have a loving staff that actually care about me. But it was also part of me needing to communicate, right? Firstly, I need to communicate this is irrational. It's irrational. I mean, you can argue that there's like, that there's auditory issues that we have in our life, but it's irrational. It should not bother me whether you're chewing ice or not. In my opinion, it shouldn't. But it is who I am. And so I need to be honest about that with, with the people I work with, the people that I'm in relationship with. And when they love me, back, one of the things they say, well, if that bothers you, we'll be careful about that. It is irrational, (laughs) but we love you. And if that's going to bother you, we're going to be careful about that. So many times we tell people when they tell us, when they're honest with us about their feelings, that really irritates me. Well, you shouldn't be irritated by that, but they are irritated by that. We need to be a lot less telling people what they should and shouldn't feel And a lot more, well, if that bothers you, I love you. And I will go ahead and make an adjustment. So let's see what the things are that that irritated you. Let's take a look at that word cloud that we have. Let's see what is going to come up on it. I want to see how it's worked its way out. Let's talk about some of the things that that we see on that word cloud, hopefully here in a second. Wow. This is a impressive word cloud. There is a lot of stuff there. Um, the big ones, you, the bigger the word, the more, more people wrote it. Um, dishonesty, laziness. And look at that. I think traffic is number one. And apparently sisters, uh, that, that's, that's close. But school, rudeness. Uh, we can see a whole lot of things. Um, closed-minded people, as you can see that on the outskirts, talking in movies, um, uh, racist you know, there's some really good things up there, things that, sh- that maybe they should irritate us. Racism should probably irritate us. It should bother us. Because why? Because racism pulls away from relationship. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do when we start feeling irritable? One of the things I want to ask you is, what do you think actually causes? What do you think it is that causes irritability? Well, you know, A sense of injustice, like with racism, can cause that. Um, Chewing ice could be an auditory issue that you've got going on. But a lot of times there's there's other factors involved as well. Sometimes there's medical issues going on, right? Um, People who, who have chronic pain. 
are going to be more susceptible to irritability, right? Because when you hurt, you're not always really rational about how you're feeling. It's very hard to be in, 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 in deep pain and to not be irritable. Uh, I have had a kidney stone. And when I had the kidney stone, I was not somebody you wanted to be around. I was hurting. Um, other things that can cause irritability are low blood, pre- uh, blo- low blood sugar, pardon me, right? Um, we've heard of hangry, right? I mean hangry, hungry and angry. But it, that's actually a medical thing. If your, if your blood sugar drops, your brain is going to start feeling more irritable. I can tell you for myself, when I don't have enough sleep, I can tell that I am going to be more irritated. I can guarantee it. My wife can guarantee it. You went to bed late. This is not going to be a fun day. So there are things that we can control. I can control the amount of sleep I can get. I can probably try to figure out how to have food around to make sure that my blood sugar goes up. So there's some things that we can control. What do we do for the things that are outside of our control? I found a great article online. Um, it's a, it was found uh, at uh, verywellmind.com, and it was uh, written by Amy Morin. It's called Eight Things to Do If You Feel Irritable, and it was actually medically reviewed by Dr. Uh, Rachel Goldman, who is a psychologist. And, it was, and so great article on eight things that you can do with irritability. I've adapted it. I've actually added a couple things in here, and I've changed the wording around a little just for fairness, but I may want to make sure that the people who did the majority of the heavy lifting here get the credit for it, okay? So the first thing when you're dealing with irritability that you can do is own it. If somebody says, you seem irritable. No, no, I'm fine. Maybe the thing to do is stop and go, yeah, you know, I am feeling irritable. You're right. I'm sorry about that. I am irritable. Why am I irritable? What's causing it? What's causing my irritability? Did I not get enough sleep last night? Am I hungry? Is it that auditory thing that we were talking about? Is it a sense of injustice in the world that this is not just? Is it that I am late for a meeting and being stuck in, in traffic is going to make me more late? What's causing my irritability? So remember how I said in previous sermons, if you can name it, you can tame it. A lot of times we don't really put a a real name on the irritability that we're feeling, and we certainly don't take time to think about what's really causing it. But when we do that, once we start being able to name it and say what's causing it, we can actually start to tame it. Here's one that that I want to talk about. Deep breaths. Um, The military likes to use something that they call box breathing that I've found to be incredibly... um, helpful in my life. And what you do is you, you breathe in for five seconds. You hold that for five seconds. You let it out for five seconds. You wait for five seconds. You breathe in for five seconds. You hold it for five. You see it in this, it's just this box. And you do that for several, you know, for about maybe five minutes. And it's incredible how you will find your mood leveling out. God created us this way. There's some people who are going to talk about deep breathing as like it's some sort of God created us to need oxygen, okay? And when we can put oxygen into our body, it helps us. And so sometimes when we're feeling irritated, one of the things to do is to go ahead and get those deep breaths into our body to help us get the oxygen we need to be able to think straight. So um, that's a little tip that. Um, that, that Amy talks about in this article. And you can look this up, by the way. It's a, a fantastic article. Next thing, uh, take a break. Sometimes you can take a break. Sometimes you can't. But if you can take a break and you're fearing, feeling irritable, you know, you're in that conversation with that child, that parent, that person, and you start feeling your irritability going up with them because they're not being reasonable and they think you're not being reasonable. Sometimes the thing to do is just say, time out. Let me walk away. Let me collect myself. Let me take some deep breaths and let's get back to this later. Maybe it's a project that you're working on. You're feeling that irritation rise. And what happens is that irritation rises with the project. You take it out on your coworkers who are not, who are innocent, but you're frustrated with the project. Take a short break, come back to it after you've had a chance to take some deep breaths. Um, Exercise. This is a big one. 
um, a lot of us um, may not understand the, the correlation between irritability and not exercising. But getting your exercise will actually help you stay in a more positive mood when you get your proper exercise. This was an interesting one to me that I'd never heard before, but apparently chewing gum, they've done studies that show that if you chew gum, it will actually increase your, your, your good mood, what's going on. And so if you're feeling ir- irritable, uh, Amy suggests that you chew gum. That's one of the things that could help, help you. I'd never heard that. I haven't tried it out myself, but it was medically reviewed and they showed some literature. So I'm going to go with that. All right. The next thing you can do is reframe your negativity. What does that mean? It means you take what, what the negativity that you're feeling and you frame it differently. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, being stuck in traffic, which is what Amy does in her article. She says, instead of thinking about how angry you are that you're not getting where you need to be, you think, you know what? Life will be okay. This has happened to me in the past and things have worked out. There are thousands of people around me stuck in traffic who are also frustrated. It'll be okay reframe what the situation you're in to put a positive light on it instead of the negative that you're feeling. Prayer. You know, taking time to pray and ask God. There's some things that I just can't get rid of on my own. And so I just ask God to be there and help me figure it out. I know I'm fearing irritable God. Be with me. Take this away. Take this irritability and the, the way I'm wanting to kind of break relationship. Bible study. You know, it's helpful to me to contemplate how loving Jesus was, to see how he lived. And then it's also helpful for me to see how other people who weren't Jesus kind of botched things and Jesus loved them anyway. Yeah. And then finally, here's one that I really want you to think about. It's interesting to me that if you have cancer, you will go see a doctor the majority of the time. But when we have mental health issues, we often will not go see a professional who can help us. Can I just tell you, there should not be a stigma to seeing mental health professionals. There shouldn't be. People, I've heard people say, well, I just need to pray and study the Bible and then God will, God will solve that. Well, yes, pray, study the Bible when you have cancer too. But you're still gonna go see the doctor. Go see a doctor. If you have irritability that's overwhelming, that's creating anger and hurt in your life, please go see a medical professional. Go see your primary care doctor. Talk to them about it. Go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Go see somebody who can help you. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with taking medications for mood disorders any more than there's something wrong with taking medication for your toothache or to help you with cancer. If you are doing it through a licensed professional, If you're doing it through a licensed professional who is managing it, you are doing the right thing. You are taking advantage of what God has provided to you. He has provided these people and these tools in our lives to help us. So if you're feeling overwhelming irritability that just won't go away, you've done everything else on this list, or even if you haven't done everything else on this, don't be afraid to talk to a a, a medical professional about how you can help yourself with these things. Because what happens is unchecked, irritability breaks up relationships. And what we always want to do is build relationships. You know, irritability is that stepping stone to breaking relationships. Let's all ask God to help us ruthlessly eliminate irritability from our lives. All right, now is the time for the Q&A, the questions and answers. Uh, This is where some of the online community has sent in some questions, but that just because you're here in-house doesn't mean that you can't participate. So please uh, join me either on the church website or on Facebook and put a question right into the chat. And um, it's fun and it's easy. Just give it a whirl. Um, (laughs) So um, We have a couple of questions in, but uh, first, is it safe for me to say that in summary, it's that feeling irritable is normal, but where what we do with it afterwards is where we need love, or is that? I think you nailed it. We can okay. just go to the closing prayer now. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, we have a couple of questions oh, for okay. real, but um, the this is uh, from Jehemi. He asks, uh, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it here real quick, but he says, um, someone who has a sanguine character personality at, in general is, is told, they aren't irritable, or you hear a lot of people say, I don't get angry. Um, so how can someone that's like that relate to someone who's just, it seems to be angry all the time? 
<laughs> um, <laughs> just have compassion and empathy, I suppose. I mean, I, I know that it can be for, for probably a sanguine personality, it can be kind of hard to understand why those of us who are melancholy clerics can kind of, um, <laughs> we're, we're, I, I'm probably more sanguine, I guess, or, uh, phlegmatic, I believe. Um, and sometimes I'm like, man, why are they so angry all the time? Yeah. I, I don't get it. Yeah. If you're sanguine phlegmatic, you will not understand the sermon whatsoever. <laughs> like, You'll be like, that was a waste of an hour. What's irritable? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but, but, but in all seriousness, I think that there's things that irritate all of us here and there. And I think that probably whether you're sanguine phlegmatic, I think maybe the bigger challenge for you is to actually recognize it in yourself when it's showing up. Um, and so that my challenge would be, um, to do your best to recognize it because what I've seen happen with a lot of uh, phlegmatic personalities is that it builds up in their life and they don't diagnose it and they keep pushing it to the side instead of actually bringing it out. When you know you're angry, it's a lot easier to deal with it than when you don't put that, recognize it. And so when it comes to, but when it comes to that question of how to deal with people like that, again, I think it's compassion mm-hmm. and love and, uh, and and just doing your best to uh, not allow that to push you into the same place. Mm, for sure. I I know whenever I do get irritable, I also immediately get embarrassed just because not something I'm used to. And no, I don't think anybody enjoys someone else that's irritable. No, <laughs> most of the time we don't. All right. Here's an, uh, another question. This one comes from Zoe. Um, and uh, she says that when she's irritated, sometimes it's it's hard to let it go. How can she? How can she let it go? Um, I would, I'd refer you back to that list that I gave. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good one to go to. And I would also, um, if you have a hard, if you are finding that you're having a hard time letting go, this is really where I would encourage you, um, to come talk to somebody on our pastoral team. Um, c- come talk to a, a licensed, um, professional, uh, mental health per, uh, advisor, a psychologist, mm-hmm. psychiatrist, um, um, a counselor. These are people who can help you work through why that's there. Cause a lot of times we can't, sometimes we can't really put a finger on it. We can't, I said, try to own it and try to name what's doing it. Sometimes you, you can't figure it out. I don't know why. And sometimes it can go back to some very deep-rooted hurt in our life that happens sometimes when we're younger, and we don't really recognize that that's, that's the trigger until we deal with that. It can be hard to deal with the pain and frustration that we're feeling now. And it, it is hard sometimes. Well, maybe talking it through with somebody is what they do. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we are out of time for the Q&A today. But uh, if there's any other questions, feel free to still submit them because we will answer some of them during the second service uh, sometimes, as well as on the podcast. And definitely you want to listen to this last week's podcast. It's called This Is Whole Life. There is a special little bonus that you want to pay attention to this last week. So make sure you check it out. And uh, it comes out every Wednesday morning. So. All right. Thank you. you. And I will just double down on what Stanley said. If you didn't listen to this last week's podcast, if you're not a podcast person, but you uh, enjoy gelato, you might want to, you know, just listen to last week's podcast. Just saying, just saying, just saying, just saying. So anyway, um, you know, there's a lot of hard things in life for us to deal with, right? Life isn't easy. Each one of us has our challenges. And wherever you're at, I hope you know the grace of God covers you. I hope you know that that God loves you just the way you are and that he's given you a love letter to help you be the happiest, most balanced person that you can be. And his power is there to transform us. That while he loves us as we are, he also is in the business of transforming us. That's good news, right? Yeah, I think it's great news in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, you know I love you. Go love your world. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church and our podcasts, Speaking of Grace and its companion, 15 with Andy, Randy, and Jeff, are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation.
Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians. All focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.